Hey Rebels, my name is Matthew Barton. Welcome to the Rebellion Brewing Podcast. One of the formative craft beer memories seared into my mind is walking through a barley field a few weeks before harvest. We were able to take fresh grains and crack them between our teeth. They were grassy and lightly sweet. Later that day, we got to taste different roasted malt varieties side by side, and those flavors ranged from rich chocolate, roasted coffee, sweet honey, and bready crackers. Of course, that barley field was owned by Matt Enns, and the roasted malts were from his craft malting facility, known as Maker's Malt, located in the Rostron area. If you drank the recent Resilience beer or any other Sasscraft beers lately, the odds are very good it was Matt's Barley in your glass. So let's get into it. Matt, welcome to the show. Oh, it's great to be here. How's it going? It's going well. Yeah, it's a, it's a beautiful day. We had uh, almost three quarters of an inch of rain over the weekend, and uh, that always puts a smile on a farmer's face. I know who you are, and I know what you do, but let's pretend my audience doesn't. Who are you, and what do you do? Okay, so I guess I do wear a few different hats. But the start of the whole thing is that I'm a farmer in Rostron, Saskatchewan on a multi-generational farm with my dad, as well as a couple of other partners. And so we're primary producers, just like many are in Saskatchewan. And then, you know, more relevant to kind of this podcast is that we started Saskatchewan's first and only craft malting facility about three years ago in Rostron. And so we're also value adding and creating a, a unique product here, uh, malt for Saskatchewan's brewers and distillers. How did you get started? Well, it's kind of an interesting story, I think. Um, so for a couple of years, my sister-in-law was living in Orlando and uh, I've been a physical therapist um, for over 10 years, but then I had bought into the farm and so we had a couple years window, my wife and I, where we had no kids and she was working on our master's and PhD doing research. So we were pretty mobile. So I spent uh, up, upwards of three months in, in Florida, two winters in a row. And uh, I got involved with this group called the Nona Brew Crew. And it kind of opened my eyes to craft beer a little bit. So this was a while back already when Saskatchewan scene was relatively young. And these guys were, were so into beer. Um, a bunch of them had uh, memberships in Cigar City, and they could go to the Hanapu Day. Um, they would line up for special releases on these days, and they would get, you know, or even get packages delivered to their house and then come out and share them at the brew crew events. And I was like, wow, this is what craft beer is going to be in Saskatchewan, you know, someday. And then, uh, you know, we kind of combined that with the fact that and I can't take any credit for this, but my dad and his partner, Jim Flath and Chad Crickow were uh, growing barley at a premium level in one of the best barley growing regions in the world of Saskatchewan. And even within that region of Saskatchewan in some of the best dirt um, to grow malt barley. So I thought, you know, we have this ability to create a premium product, but we're kind of just sending it down the rail and waving goodbye. Right. And so those two ideas kind of merged to, to, to say like, Hey, maybe we got something here. I, from a marketing perspective, love your guys's artwork and logos. You can, it feels like no detail was missed. And when we got to kind of see and, and touch the facility and just be in there, it's a really cool space. How long did it take you guys to build that? I guess it depends on if you talk about, like kind of the creation of the idea and, and milling it around, or if you just talk about, you know, breaking ground and putting the building up. But in terms of the creation of the idea, it was pretty difficult because there was no um, template. So no one else was doing this in Saskatchewan and actually no one else was doing that in Western Canada at the time. And so uh, 
there was a couple of years, I would say a year and a half, at least, where it was just about ideation and, okay, if we were going to do this, what would it look like? And what equipment would we need? What was even available? So going back that long, there was nobody producing craft malting equipment in North America. Um, there was just Casper Schultz in Germany and uh, somebody out of the UK. And both of those were pretty daunting on it, like financially, as well as just, you know, dealing with importing and everything else. So it, it kind of was real grassroots looking at the Craft Maltsters Guild, getting on Google and just trying to see, you know, what would it look like? And that took a couple of years to kind of create in my head. And, and uh, once we actually got the building kind of going, I think it was in May of 2017. And by January of 2018, we had our first commercial batch. So that process, it, it was fairly quick, really, in, in a lot of ways. When it comes to, you talk about your family growing this malted barley and you have this idea for the facility, you reference that it's kind of a vertical climb to finance that thing. And we joke about that on the same side for brewing. It's it's a lot of money to, to get going. So when you're the first, you're kind of on your own learning. There's, there's a huge... Uh, learning process there's no one to kind of hold your hand and and walk you through all the steps do you have a particular memory of a, of a big lesson learned early on oh man we learned so many lessons i mean we tried to go in prepared i uh, went to the canadian malt barley technical center uh malting course in winnipeg read a lot of books and then again used the resources of the North American Craft Maltsters Guild, which were fantastic. Um, I don't know if I have any memories from about the first six months of malting because I do, I do. But I had twin boys uh, less than two months after our first commercial batch. And I was sleeping in the plant like probably twice a week, trying to like keep my wife, you know, sane. And, uh, and we got this, this, this piece of equipment and it was basically the second piece that these guys had made out in North America. And, you know, we, it was supposed to be fairly ready for commercialization, but really I would call it what we did in the first six months prototyping. Um, we helped rework design of software, of mechanical, and it, the learning curve was was massive on the production side. So I don't know if I have any like specific events. There was just a avalanche of events, you know, digging out malt out of the, out of the vessel that was like caked in, like with like a shovel, um, having our big agitation system crack, you know, like it was like one after another. And uh, thank goodness I had the resources of the farm and the problem solving that that entails. Like, you know, especially as you go up a generation or two, even um, those guys had to learn how to fix things and make things work. And I think that without that, it would have been borderline. Can we keep going here? You know, like it was, it was very, very beneficial and uh, that's that's the biggest thing I remember about kind of that first year is just trying, you know, to make it work. And, and eventually having lots of places where we could like plant a flag and say, hey, we did that. You know, it's like there was there was lots of positives, too, but uh, it was it was tough. You got your equipment, you like order it from the manufacturer. It's not even like turnkey you then had to like on the fly adjust it while you're trying to just malt and bring some money in and get it into, into brewers hands to start taste testing. What do you, what do you call that huge, massive, big vessel that I saw that one day? Yeah. So our system is, I guess there's a few kind of industry terms for it, but it, you could call it an all in one vessel 
or a steep germ kiln vessel, like a GSKV, um, germ steep kiln vessel. Um, and yeah, so that's what you would have seen. And uh, it's, it's one of the ways that craft malt houses malt barley. Uh, it's probably the most common uh, or close to the most common way. And there's a few different iterations of how they do that. But yeah, that's what you see. And, and there's certainly pros and cons to having that type of system. It works at a certain scale, but if you get big, like the big multinational maltsters, that kind of thing wouldn't work at all. So it's more, more boutique for sure. When I try to describe this to people, I said it looks like uh, a dairy truck trailer flipped on its side. It's vertical, like two and a half stories about. It's got ladders running up the side. Like it's it's pretty tall. Like it's you could f- stuff a whole bunch of people in there. Yeah, for sure. I, I guess it's probably like well, it's under twenty feet because I know my building's twenty one, and we had to make that work. <laughs> so I know it's under that. But yeah, it's a big vessel and. You know, it's really quite an engineered vessel as well. So there's a false bottom that air and water can freely flow through, but the grain will stay on top of. Uh, the physics of the airflow are engineered so that you have low volume, sorry, low pressure, high volume air that will smoothly go through the grain bed. And because it has to do all the different processes of malting, the steeping, the germination, and the kilning, of course, it has to be equipped to do all of them as well. So yeah, it's a, it's, it's a pretty impressive piece of machinery in a lot of ways. And certainly we bootstrapped a ton of things in our plant from me digging the plumbing out of the floor with my own excavator, um, to Jim's 80 year old dad welding out our, uh, our stands for our equipment. But, uh, in terms of our main system that we didn't, you know, spare any, expense there uh and tried to get something very good so yeah it's very impressive uh, i think to look at it operates on um automated sequences which we do have to monitor and and adjust every day but uh you know the after a couple years we've got her fine-tuned pretty good what you're saying or what i'm hearing from you is that it took you a little bit of a time to kind of adjust and learn and now you're able to be more consistent with the output for sure yeah like i think i mean this is a simplification for sure but i always remember or or talk about it in like year one my biggest concern was learning production and malting and uh i was on my own for for quite a bit of that year as well and uh so it was kind of like, I'm just going to get good at malting. Um, a lot of times what I used to do is I would, I would actually start a little bit of malt on the floor at the same time as the batch. And then you would be able to watch it go through the, the, the phases of malting. And it's, you know, it's right in front of you. So you could grab it, look at it, bite it, and just like try to get a sense of what malt, what the barley does as it grows and, kind of like fast track that experience side of malting. And so we used to do that all the time and uh, just see the, the rootlets and the acrospires grow and, and the texture change and kind of feel it and smell it and all those things. And uh, that, that's what I felt year one really was. And then it kind of, you know, the, the needs of the business change all the time and I kind of think year two was like, okay, we got, we had, we brought in Steven Meyer, who is a, a former brewer and uh, had done his malting courses as well. And so he was able to take on a little bit of the production load. And I was able to start doing more visiting with brewers and talking about what we're trying to do. Um, so we were making good malt consistently and, and kind of at full, full 24 uh, seven malting, which we, we do today as well. So now it was like, okay, I gotta, I gotta start selling some of this stuff and, 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 and getting some customers, you know? So that's how I always see a year two as being like really on the, on the, uh, trail to, to get to know people and see what needs they had, um, maybe what needs the industry had and see where we could kind of fit in. I want to back it up a bit when we 
take it all the way back to the field and the kind of the barley, the class of barley you guys are bringing up, the way it was related to me was via Mark Heisey's story. He went out to uh, Sierra Nevada. He won a homebrew contest. He, he meddled. And one of the prizes was you get to go brew with Sierra Nevada. And they're doing this cheesy, hey, let's ice break and meet everybody. And they get to Mark and he's just like, yeah, you don't know where I'm from. Don't worry about it. And they're like, no, no, tell us. Tell us where you're from. And he goes, oh, I'm from Saskatchewan. You've never heard of Saskatchewan. And they're like, uh, yes, we have. We buy all our barley from Roster in Saskatchewan. And then... <laughs> Mark kind of, he, he's like, oh, we, we have a huge connection then. <laughs> yeah. And then I got to meet you guys and you were saying, you were telling me this story about how your family was selling barley sight unseen. Like the breweries didn't even get it graded. They were just like, yeah, we're going to buy truckloads and truckloads of barley because we trust the product the farmers from the Rostron area are putting out. That sounds pretty exceptional to me. Well, that, that is an awesome story. And interestingly, I didn't know that about Mark, but um, we actually got a chance, this is kind of a connection here, to uh, hang out with Ken Grossman at the uh, Craft Maltsters Guild this year. So I'm on the board of that now. And it was a virtual, virtual hangout, but very interesting guy. And I would also love to go to Sierra Nevada one day. And then I'll, I'll make sure to tell him, hey, I'm from Saskatchewan, like, this, some of this is probably our barley. Like I want the real tour. Come on. But uh, yeah, no, I think that that's that story that you kind of related there. I can, you know, just kind of retell it quickly, but basically one of the years, this was oh, over 10 years, I think now ago or close, but our big malting facility in Saskatchewan, which takes thousands of bushels of barley out of farmers fields and value adds them every year. Uh, was out of malt at the end of August. So they were hoping to be able to get to the new crop year. And the timing of that is always a little bit, you know, difficult because it's, it's farming and mother nature has the trump cards, right? But they were short and uh, they came to three farms in Saskatchewan uh, and asked, can you guys get us barley like tomorrow, basically? And I, it wasn't, it was maybe like, three days in the future kind of thing. And we're like, yeah, our barley's ready to go. Um, none of it's harvested because nobody's barley was harvested yet. But typically what happens is you have to submit a sample from a bin. They basically take it through germination tests and all of the other malt quality analysis. And that takes time for sure. And then you see, so you've got this lot that they've tested and then they'll, they'll call for call for that barley later in the year. But this time they didn't have time to do the same typical diligence. And so that's why they came to three farms that they knew and trusted to grow really consistent quality barley. And my dad's farm was one of them. So we had uh, 80 super bees, that's 42 tons, 43 tons each, through our farm in about two and a half days. So we were combining as fast as we could, and it was basically getting loaded. Some of it was getting loaded directly in the field, which is really like not a thing that happens with malt. And so that was just an iconic moment for our farm. Um, I think we got some pictures from the top of the bins of these trucks just sneaking down the driveway. And, you know, it's, it's a good pit. It's a good story. Like you remembered it. So it's a good story for me to tell about my dad and the, the what kind of um, reputation they have built up over decades. I got to ride around in a Super B a couple of years ago. Uh, this is way before the pandemic. And we were just hanging out with Rodney and his son, Rodney, Rodney McNiven from up north. And one of the things I remember is like, these Super B trucks are huge. They're massive. And I also remember being very, very itchy. <laughs> it just, <laughs> it's everywhere. It's in your ears. It's up your nose. It's like down your neck. Anywhere there's like a space for barley chaff to get in and make you itchy. Oh, it's it's a, you're done. It's a story of my life, Matt. Yeah, I hear you. Well, it, it is very like, it's, 
it reminds us of scale too, right? So you saying those barley trap, those semis are huge. Well, you're right. They are huge. Um, and our scale at our plant is totally um, predicated by the Saskatchewan craft brew scene. It's not size to Saskatchewan agriculture. And so I see this scale in real life every day where I have one hand, you know, we're, we're working with, commodity scale Saskatchewan farming and on the other hand we're working craft and at a total small batch level and I tell guys it's a, it's awesome to have that interconnection and that uh you know thousand foot view I, I tell my farming friends like you know sometimes I sell things especially to home brewers maybe at like two pounds and they're just like why would you even do that like that's ridiculous you know like and and it is a bit ridiculous sometimes when I look at my super B over here and then bagging into this two pound bag, but, but it's also really rewarding because at the commodity side, you grow something, you put your heart and soul into it, into the land, into your agronomic practices and everything. And then it basically, you, you know, it goes down the road and you just waving at taillights, right? Um, you never see it again it's mixed in with thousands of other farmers goods. So any kind of premium quality or treatment you give to it is kind of lost. And, uh, it, you know, it goes to really typically to really large companies that, that make something out of it, which is great. I, I have nothing against that, but it, there's something very unique and rewarding about being able to take what you make and give it to somebody that, is also, you know, a small business person or an individual and then have something like tangible come out of that. Pardon the pun. You're planting the seeds to build a domestic industry. It's a, it's a not just horizontal, it's vertical industry. So you get to work with local businesses here and help them build up. And I think it, what it gets me most excited, what I like to brag about when I'm trying to explain makers and you could flesh this out is that this is ours it's all saskatchewan this was our farmers blood sweat and tears this was our grain coming out of our fields and we get to put it into our glass with our brewers and our talent and this was something that saskatchewan made you can touch it you can smell it and feel it at every step of the way i know you on a first name basis we've shaken hands i've eaten barley at your damn facility like <laughs> yeah. it, it feels so personal to me like your success is my success um when you win i'm super proud for you guys you know uh when the other brewers are like yeah we're totally getting into makers and we're doing all this great stuff i'm like fuck yeah i'm gonna totally have that i'm gonna totally try that it, it's like a di different emotional level you know i agree like for sure for us i mean it really goes to that kind of full circle local feel. And in some ways it it's reminiscent of what I picture it being like, you know, pre prohibition, right. Where you would be growing grain. Um, most centers would have a local mill. If you had a brewery, they would probably be malting it at that brewery. And uh, you know, it's, it's so long ago for us, that we don't even see the what's left of the foundation of those places in my generation. My grandpa will remember them a little bit. And uh, my dad, probably not really, although he'll have some memories of, more, of a more local connection, like even hauling to a local elevator versus a regional elevator and, and having the guys there grade the grain and, and take, you know, taking it in in a three ton truck instead of a 42 ton super B. Right. But uh you know, hopefully I see this happening and maybe COVID accelerated some of that, but, but there is a desire to kind of know the circle of your, of your food. Um, to know. Oh, I think the call dropped there. I think, uh, must've just lost my internet for a few seconds. Here. Uh, we were kind of talking about, um, I guess I, I did my whole diegetic thing and I kind of you were reflecting on the influence of uh, a renewed desire for local or supporting local. 
yeah, I do think that that kind of maybe started with the farm to table food side of things a little bit. And uh, certainly craft beer is in the same vein. And uh, you see people wanting to know where their food or their raw ingredients come from. They want to see that producer and, and kind of know their practices. And I, I think COVID almost accelerated that a little bit again, where, you know, people for two reasons, first they, they feel like they want to help and they want to support local and I'm local and I want people to help, you know, support me. And this is kind of how it all works. Um, but on, even on a practical side, I think, many people have seen their supply chains disrupted and had trouble, you know, whether it's getting aluminum cans or whatever it is in the brewery. I mean, these troubles have, have kind of come through whatever industry you're in. Right. And uh, to have a su short supply chain and to know the people involved in that supply chain gets even more valuable when you, when you feel those disruptions. So, I mean, it doesn't get a whole lot shorter than our farm, Many of our fields are within three, four miles of the malt house, and we self-deliver 90% of our, our malt um, to places in the province. So whether you're talking, you know, reliability, whether you're talking carbon footprint, whether you're talking just uh, being able to call a person that can actually solve your problem, you know, that short supply chain is, has been beneficial as well. So it's kind of like, you know, a little bit the, on the consumer side, the desire to be local, but there's also a practical side to it that I think people have appreciated through COVID as well. The key word that kind of pops into my mind relates back to the beer that we brewed with your malt is resilience. We're, we're helping build an industry that can take a punch that locally remains strong and doesn't get messed up when there are bumps in the road and when i when i look at what you guys are doing it just makes me really uh un irrationally proud <laughs> everything you guys have pulled off i i, I kind of want to people to be able to to feel the same way i do like when i get to walk through the fields and and see what you guys are doing and then at the end of the day when we're drinking that resilience beer and people were raving and i'm like yeah this this was in saskatchewan this is all Sask and you get to drink a piece of Saskatchewan, you know, did you get a chance to try that uh, resilience beer? I know it's damn near sold out. Like we sold out of it weeks ago. It, it's probably on shelves in like smaller yeah, yeah, communities yeah, yeah. that just have a slower uptick, but yeah, um, yeah, yeah. It, it sold fast. Yeah. Like I think we might actually bring it back on a seasonal basis. Oh, that'd be awesome. As a recipe just yeah. because people were like, Oh man, I got to have this. Well, it's, you know, it's a really good name and story for where we are, right? So I like it. I remember when I was hanging out with you guys, I was asking you tons of questions about roasting and malting to spec for craft brewers. And I kind of, you kind of touched on this a bit, but I wanted to circle back and just ask you, why was this important? Why was growing to spec for little guys important to you like why did you take that step well i think that's one of the places that we can really kind of be on the cutting edge so certainly if you're talking about scale and volume and uh, those types of things that's not our game that's the game of the big multinational monsters and brewers for that matter but they're really good at being consistent and generic. Um, we want to be really good at bringing the highest possible product value product to, to forward. And I think that really talks in the craft side about flavor. Um, not only flavor, because you still need the extract and the diastatic power and, you know, the, the, the free amino nitrogen and all of the other goods. And, in a lot of ways, we're lucky because those things on, you know, a well-established Saskatchewan barley growing farm like ours, those are almost implied. And so as long as we, you know, kind of do our jobs as maltsters, that's going to happen. So 
really from there, like that's one of the big value propositions we can bring is, is flavor and unique um, products. So I think what, one of the interesting things that happened along this line of thought is that, you know, we kind of always thought, okay, it's going to be, you know, what we do in the malt house, maybe what varieties we're growing, you know, those are going to be the things that drive some of that unique flavor profile. But we actually, you know, kind of figured out some stuff that we could take right back to the farm gate. So that was an interesting discussion, right? Like, so my dad, his farming partners who are very, very good at what they do. Um, I kind of had to go back and tell them, Hey, we got to change what we're doing here. Um, and, and because what they were so good at producing, you know, high yielding, high quality barley, um, that fit the commodity world. And after a couple of years of really malting with the barley, understanding how the brewers use the barley, all of a sudden our, you know, our, our, uh, ideal malt barley changed. So instead of, you know, yield and efficiency being your main metrics, it's like performance and flavor being your, your main metrics. So we kind of took that back to the farm gate. And I think in the most meaningful way, uh, last year, and this was about two or three years in the making with farm, farm scale trials, but we were actually able to do, to grow some barley with basically no nitrogen applied, um, which lowers our protein content. It increases the extract for the brewers. So they get more bang for their buck, more brew house yield and really sustainable because you're not adding extra fertilizer. And, uh, but the other thing that was really beautiful about this is that the flavor profile that we came out of that was beautiful. It was the best malt sensory stuff that we've ever made. And so we've kind of like put that into standard practice now and, and made more, um, put more acres in that way this year. Uh, just a, a really light, almost a little bit of floral, a little bit of honey, even in the base malt that, like I said, scored as, scored as high on the malt sensory um, analysis as, as anything we'd ever done. So it's kind of a win, win, win across the board. Uh, the only place where you have a debate on whether it's a win is at right at the farm where, you know, maybe we used to be getting a hundred bushels and we're getting 90, but that's very easy to account for. Um, you just pay a little bit more for it and, and you're good. So that's probably the most unique um, way we took it back to the farm gate. But I mean, you can take it forward too in the malting process and the different things we've done there or, or even the, the different varieties that we're opting to grow too. And uh, flavor is, it's kind of like the, the next frontier of malt. So hops have been sexy for a long time. Uh, malt's been a workhorse. And I mean, it always has to be, it's the backbone. But uh, there's certainly lots of work, even at the higher, you know, um, university or institutional levels, starting to discuss that. And I think it's really fun. You know, you look at, uh, you can look at things like terroir or vintages like this year versus the other year and uh, varietal changes. And like this year we got this uh, new variety planted where it's not really a commercially available variety, really, it's a privately owned variety, but it won the North American Malt Cup in the Pilsner and the Base Malt uh, Division. So it, I kind of took notice, like it won both base malts. Um, pretty interesting. I never heard of it before. It's called Cerveza, so it's like a really, you know, sexy name or whatever, right? And so we we, got, we found it. We got our hands on it and planted 10 acres of it. And and that's going to be really interesting too. What does that bring to the flavor discussion? Uh, but I, I'm, I'm rambling a little bit, but I could go on about flavor and, and that type of thing for a long time. Feel free to make me, uh, put me in a, a box here so I don't just keep talking. <laughs> Well, you said so many great things. I want to unpack a little bit of it for clarity for the audience. My understanding is when you're a farmer and you're trying to get a product ready to go to a maltster and you're trying to make grade, 
you kind of have to thread the needle. And, and when you're trying to hit that spec, you're trying to hit that grade. It's, it's kind of like whacking a tightrope. And if you screw up, it costs you a lot of money. So you want to be consistent. You want to hit those volumes. There's a great incentive to not miss that mark. So when you refer to your partners and you're saying, Hey guys, we got to, we got to change this. You're really, really good at volumes. Really, really good at the high level. To me in my brain that says they want to make the most money per square inch or per square foot on the field. And when you're taking that hit on the yield, it's like, Ooh, Ooh, I'm taking a hit on the yield. Like, Oh, that it just cuts me in the heart. <laughs> but if you're saying the promise is the brewers, are going to taste the difference. The brewers are going to recognize that they're getting a more efficient grain that will produce more alcohol with fewer grains, but it's also going to have this like excellent flavor. We can start to say, this is like Kobe beef. This is region lock. This was roster and uh, barley. And then we can talk to consumers and say, this 2019, this 2020 barley this is something special. This was a golf swing. They had really good rain that year. You know, the soil is really excellent. We can take it to the next level of like, say wine where people can identify and prize these attributes. And it's like this whole new way of thinking about a premium product. We've, we ourselves at rebellion have talked about on our beer cans labeling, like this barley came from this region in Saskatchewan, this hop, these are the hops and this is where they came from. And this is when it was harvested. And you can like scan a little code on the beer can and it will come up on your phone and tell you exactly who, what, who grew it, when it was harvested, when it was packaged all the way straight from kettle to glass. And I, I think truly think consumers care about that. And that is the future for craft beer. And I, when you talk about those things, it just makes, it's like Lego bricks just plugging into place. No, and when you like, even when you talk about that, I'm like, okay, I could pick up on that. I could pick up on that. I could pick up on that. And they're all like, you know, you're hitting the nail on the head, right? Like, first of all, I think making it a little bit akin to the wine world, you think people often buy wine purely on variety. They're like, I like a Cab Sav. I like a Merlot. Um, and on the malt side, people are almost unaware of the varieties. Um, some people may be aware of Copeland and I mean, we're in Saskatchewan, we're about as close as you can get to production. Um, especially as you move out a little bit further, people are very unaware of varieties, but there's a whole avenue to like you discussed to kind of bring that into the discussion and kind of bring more nuance and information to people, uh, in terms of the information on the cans, like we're, the traceability concept, like the information on the can that you, you discussed, uh, we're actually part of a traceability project where we'll be able to bring the data from the farm through the malt house, through the brewery to the consumer in a way that's, you know, uh, visually interesting, but also secure and, and shows the supply chain like a blockchain does. So that's, I think, really interesting. Um, when you talked about the farming, most Saskatchewan farms, 99% uh, of them would be commodity producers and, you know, your price takers at that point. Uh, so the prices, you know, on a, on the Minneapolis grain exchange or, or wherever it is. And so really the only way farmers have been able to stay um, in business is to become more efficient and produce more, more yield, with less acres and less money. And so that's kind of been the focus. And that's, you know, certainly was our, my dad was very, very good at that. Um, to take it to a place where your main consideration is, is kind of performance outcome related instead of efficiency and financially related is a, is a different place. And, and, uh, you know, you can even wrap that into sustainability and, and kind of a new, the new world that's kind of coming on climate solutions and, and those types of things. And, and I think that's, it's not getting less important as we go forward, you know, 
So, uh, yeah, it's, it's very interesting to kind of think about it. Talking to my, you know, to my dad and his partners about that. I mean, there's been lots of, lots of discussions we've had even about, you know, when we're, when we're doing all these test plots and agronomy plots and variety trials that we do every year. And this year, again, we have five different varieties and a bunch of agronomy. So the science of growing uh, trials, as well as the U of S breeding trials all in one site. And that's awesome. It's awesome. We'll have our farmer brewer day and I get pumped up just thinking about, you know, what we're going to find out again this year, but it's not how like the guys on the farm prefer to farm, like cleaning out the cedar every pass and putting a new variety in um, and then, you know, doing that all day instead of like actually getting acres in the ground, you know, it's, it's a bit of a fuck around. Oh, Mickey mouse would be my, what my dad would say. We're, we're doing Mickey mouse farming, you know, but I mean, thankfully I've, been, I've got good support overall i mean they worked me over for it there's no doubt about it but but uh even though i I'll, you know I'll, I'll get worked over and i'll we'll get it in and there's some pride there too but you know i could see it even though maybe they won't talk about it <laughs> i know you feel that pinch i know you're talking about kind of that pain of innovation we as a brewery feel the same thing to to take 40 liters of beer and brew an experimental test batch is fundamentally insane. Like we're not making money off 40 liters of beer. There's there's no profit to be had. What but what it is is a chance for our brewers to experiment and test and learn. So each week we've committed ourselves to 40 liters of something experimental and new and they're constantly exploring the boundaries of flavor and it might have cost us a full brewer's day because 40 liters or 2,000 liters, it takes the same amount of time for those chemical reactions to take place. That's steep, that time. Mickey Mouse, right? <laughs> Fundamentally makes no sense to brew 40 liters at our level. But we do it because we're learning. And we've made some really nice discoveries and developed some really wonderful beers out of that process. So to hear you guys kind of feeling that same pain is uh i i see the connections i see the you know we're the same man. yeah <laughs> oh i mean craft craft beer has to be there and uh i think craft malt allows craft beer and and barley and farming to discover more things right because the big guys whether it's you know multinational brewers or maltsters they don't really have the time or even facility to kind of or desire to take those things on you know so certainly you guys craft beer had to lead lead the charge and be there but i think craft malting is bringing a bunch of new uh innovation to the equation i mean this reminded me of something i did this morning we we bagged um we made a wind malt and so this is a very traditional malt. Uh, I actually steeped it in a pile. So normally you steep in a nice, you know, big vat of water. I steeped it in a pile. Um, I germinated on the floor, just like a traditional malting. And, uh, and then wind dried it. So instead of going through a kiln, it was 100% wind dry, just like they used to do in the Belgian farmhouses. And uh, I've been babysitting that batch since before my last child was born on May 11th <laughs> and today we finally took it through our uh, clean out process of course it's bridging and not running through the augers because it's got more growth and uh, we'll get it all the way through and, and me and Steven were kind of like guessing like how many bags of malt are we going to get out of this uh, 8, 10, I don't know well we got 4.25 and, uh, you that know, hurts. well, it's, it's fine. I mean, it's going to be super unique. I think like we'll, we'll brew with it in house, like, uh, on our test system. And I think we're going to make a really unique, funky, you know, kind of traditional Saison, right? Maybe some Brett yeast or something like that. And, uh, 
it could be a product that we could scale in some day. And it's a really unique malt. I guarantee you that hasn't been done in Saskatchewan for, I don't know, a hundred years. So very cool. I don't care if we make money or not, cause it was fun, but yeah, it's, it's, I totally hear you on the 40 liter and whether you're making, you know, financially prudent decisions at all times, sometimes no, but you're, you're, you're kind of hopefully figuring something out. So it's fun. I guess to try and wrap it up all in a nice little bow and bring it together, I'm sitting at my kitchen table this morning with my cup of coffee, thinking about industry golf swings, these you get one life to live and you get so many heartbeats and you get so many breaths you can take. And there are just things in your life that you'll get to experience once and never again, or maybe you get to experience it a handful of times and you never quite know when the last time you'll experience a thing. And I'm looking at my, my boy, he's 10. I'm looking at my other boy and he's five and they're huge. And I'm like, is this the last time I'm going to pick him up in my arms and kind of cradle him and hug him this way? Is, is this the last time I'm going to taste this burger that has this nice marbling with, with Rob from Prairie Smoke's special rub on the meat? And then I thought about the beer we did, this, this solo crush with these Comet hops from JGL Shepherd Farms. It was their f- like second year trial of doing these hops And it was a pure, amazing golf swing. It had this really nice peach stone fruit quality. And I've only had that once in my entire life. And I don't know if we can reproduce that again because they're small craft hop growers. And it was this really wonderful experience. And I'm just, I've crystallized it in my mind as like, if we could bring those special, unique one-off experiences, those moments in your life where you know, I might never taste this again, but it was excellent. I'm like, that's kind of what I'm chasing now in terms of beer. I want those amazing, stellar, five-star, you're never going to have it again, special experiences. And it sounds like you guys are doing the same thing. And it freaks me out that I didn't plan to have this moment in this podcast interview with you i'm just sitting there having coffee thinking about that this morning and now you're talking about it with malt and it's it's freaking me out man (laughs) (laughs) well you're making me hungry for one uh that that is that's kind of how i i uh treat my beer drinking a little bit like you know and i probably don't take enough time to actually take it in like every time, you know, every, and, and, and of course those moments are special, but, uh, you know, I've talked about it with other guys that are starting malt houses, you know, in Alberta or Ontario that, that kind of have gotten in touch with me through the craft maltsters guild and stuff. And, uh, it's a little bit different, but maybe some similarities on, on those places because it's a it's a it's a slog man like getting to where we've gotten now three and a half years in and multi runs 24 7 i've had zero or one employees three kids haven't paid myself anything yet um and so it's hard but you got to be able to plant some flags in some places and and take a step back and recognize that what we did there was really unique and really cool. And that's, you know, that those moments are a little bit like you're talking about. They're a little different, but I remember the first time we made a beer with barley that came from our farm and I knew exactly where it came from. I knew that it went through the malt process, you know, and, in this manner on these days. And then I handed it off to our friends at nine mile that time. And, uh, we made a collaboration beer called the co-pilot and, uh, it was served in my hometown at the station arts, uh, 
beer night uh, that they have once a year, which is actually, by the way, kind of a a sleeper, awesome beer event that your listeners should be aware of. But, um, and it was just like, that was one of those flags, right? And, and those come along, uh, you know, with a new business, I guess they do come along a little more often than if I was, you know, in my 13th year of being a physical therapist. But, uh, you know, the work that you have to put in to get to those is, is different as well. But we've had a few of those. Um, that was one. I know another one was uh, sitting at the same table as Dave Thomas, who's kind of like the godfather of, of malt and craft malt out of Colorado. He, he wrote the Craft Maltster's Handbook. And in Bozeman, Montana, two years ago, Stephen and I got to judge the final table of the North American Malt Cup with Dave Thomas and two other people. And uh, it was kind of like a little bit of a coming of age, like, you know, they wanted us to be at this final table to make this decision. And, uh, you know, three years ago, I, I knew nothing. I knew nothing. And I had this whole learning curve in front of me. And God, if I had to go back and do that all over again, I don't even know if I would, you know, it's so, it was so tough. Um, but you have this, this other, another point where you're just like, okay, I got to like make this an indelible moment and like take these times and, and be positive about how interesting and unique they are and think about it. So kind of crystallize it or what, some of the words you were using were, were much more descriptive, but that's kind of how I think of those things, planting some flags um, taking it all in because we do only have one life to live and you want to do something with it. I love it. I think I have, I can't ask any more questions after that. Uh, I was just a perfect end note. <laughs> Matt, thanks for your time today. Yeah, I appreciate, appreciate you having me on. Um, we, we follow rebellion. They do a fantastic job podcast. Um, just advocating for the beer industry. And so it was a, a no brainer to come on and spend a bit of time with you. And uh, if people are interested to see, you know, our, our farm year, uh, we try to tell that story through our Instagram at makers malt and uh, on our website, we've got a couple of interesting things coming up this summer that are unique. So check us out and we'll, we'll tell you all about it. And we want to tell as many people connect as many people to the farm as we can. Uh, even in our province of Saskatchewan, it's amazing, you know, how much benefit comes from connecting. So get in touch. We're out here. Cheers. Rebels, thanks for listening today. If you have any questions or comments about this episode, be sure to join us on our brand new Facebook group page, The Rebellion Brewing Podcast. I'm going to include links in the show notes to all things Maker's Malt and Sask Barley so you can find it online. I'm also proud to let you know that we're members of the Saskatchewan Podcast Network. It's a one-stop shop for tons of locally produced shows from across our province. You can find them at saspodcastnetwork.com. Be sure to follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Untapped so you don't miss out on the latest in Sascraft beer news. Thank you for joining the rebellion.